Hello all and welcome to another edition of Goddess Talks on the Goddess Project Podcast. Um, this week I had the pleasure of talking to Max Dashu. She wrote this fantastic book titled Women in Greek Mythography, Pythias, Melissae, and Titanides. And we had a fantastic conversation about all of the Greek mythology and so much of women's place in Greek mythology. And I really hope that you're going to enjoy it. Uh, Max did not feel like being on camera. She was having a day where she was like, nope, not today, I'm not in the mood. Um, so you will see me on camera. And of course you'll hear her lovely voice and see a lovely picture of her face. I hope that you really enjoy this podcast as much as we enjoyed talking about all of the things women in Greek mythology. Uh, before we move on to the interview, I just wanted to give you a couple of announcements. As many of you know, I am in Crete and it's really such a, a wonderful place to be. The energy here is incredible, as some of you know who have visited. Um, on Sunday, I am going to be running my very first virtual tour for my Patreon supporters. And um, we are going to use Zoom to go live at the site. And so if you are one of my Patreon supporters or you'd like to be, please sign up uh, at The Goddess Project on Patreon and join us this Sunday. This is the first one. I'd like to do at least one more, if not two, while I'm in Crete. So we're going to go to the ancient site of Artemis' temple in Aptera, and we're going to just walk around for an hour, and I'm going to talk about the different places that are there. There's some Roman baths, there's, an, there's a Christian church there, and of course, there's a, a small temple to Artemis and Apollo there. Oh, and we're also going to walk over to the theater. So it's going to be a real time. It's going to be on Zoom. It's going to be exciting uh, for those of you that are joining me. And I hope to do these. So I'm testing these out now with my Patreon supporters to see what they will feel like and how the technology is working and all that kind of stuff. And I hope to do them for everyone else um, in the future. That's the first one. The second one is um, we have a workshop tomorrow, a free workshop through the Goddess Wisdom Workshop series. So if you're signed up through my Artemis learning platform through Disco, then please sign up for the event that's tomorrow. Um, I'll put the links below here if you are not signed up, just join us. So these are uh, one free workshop a month and every month we pick different topics. This month, tomorrow, we're going to talk about matriarchies and the system of matriarchy, particularly in Crete, since I'm in Crete. So we're going to use that as an example, uh, but we're going to be discussing um how the system of matriarchy is the future system once, you know, capitalism falls apart. Um, and these workshops are both a part short lecture with my uh, partner instructor, Cornelia, but it's a lot of discussions and uh, you will share, I hope, uh, in the past, women and other participants share their thoughts, share their experiences, depending on the topic that we're talking about. Um, and it's very informal, although I, I do present a little history lesson, um, and it's a lot of fun. And so if you'd like to be part of our Artemis Center community and you'd like to join, we welcome you. We welcome everyone. Please feel free to join us, sign up. The workshops are free. Um, so we hope. I hope to see you there, but I know Cornelia hopes to see you there as well. Um, and I had a third update, but I can't remember what it is. So if you'd like to follow me on the adventures that are coming up, please join me anywhere at Artemis Expert or at Patreon to get some of the behind the scenes. I will also be heading in May on a cruise to the Amalfi Coast, to Morocco, to Gibraltar, to Pompeii, and I'll be taking you on some of those adventures as well. So I'm very excited for everything that's coming up this summer. Um, so without further ado, um, I give you our conversation Matt, that Max and I had. I hope that you enjoy it. Please feel free to drop us any questions that you have in the comments um, and to give us any feedback that you like uh, about the, the discussion that we're having. And I hope that you have, wherever you are, a wonderful morning, um, evening, afternoon, and I will see you all on the next episode of The Goddess 
podcast, the Goddess Project podcast. <laughs> you know, I don't edit these. So um, yeah, <laughs> I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to the Goddess Project podcast. I don't know how to say my own title sometimes. <laughs> I usually do a lot more lecturing with these uh, than interviewing, but I love, love uh, talking to people, um, especially like the the breadth of work that you have done, Max, is amazing. So um, welcome. And uh, today we're going to talk about this book and any other book that actually, I know you have another one coming that you'd like yes. to talk about. I'm very excited. Um, and perhaps we can start, if you don't mind, uh, with just telling the viewers a little bit about what inspired this this set of volumes. It seems like, of course, you've been not working on it forever, but, you know, the timing seems right. You know, I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because I would have liked to have gotten this out much, much, much sooner, but it started out, it was going to be, I wanted to look at what happened in Europe in terms of patriarchy. And how women lost our spheres of power and, you know, the whole, the whole witch hunts. I wanted to understand that those persecutions and the way that they impacted the status of women in Western Civ and the, what began as one book, chapters turned into volumes. It just kind of blew out. And, you know, there's so many different angles to, to look at. I mean, one of the things I wanted to know was about goddess religion and the way that that was done down the way that they um, drove women out of the priesthood, you know, kept women out, you know, banned women from being near altars. There were all these things that happened when you couldn't sing in church. You know, it's just, it's what patriarchal religion does as uh, an ideology, as a cultural programming to internalize patriarchy. Mm -hmm. It's not only the external constraints, but the ways that women are kept uh, policing themselves internally in the belief that God, the great patriarch, you know, wants them to cover their heads, wants them to submit to men, all of these, these things. So you know, it's, it's in many ways how religion conditions women to submission. And yeah. so that was, that was the starting point. And originally I was going to do a book called Witches and Pagans, which I eventually did publish in 2016. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there were so many different angles to this you know, the Roman Empire and before the Roman Empire, it was like, you know, the Greeks. And I didn't really want to go into the Greeks because we all had Greek mythology. You know, that was what you were taught. Yeah. That was important. The rest of the world was not important. And, you know, I resisted that. But there are ways in which Hellenic civilization is the ground floor of Western Civ as we know it. You know, even just the language and I have a part in the book where I list, all, actually a lot of it's in the uh, commentaries online because there was too much. But, um, you know, all of our, our words, bi biology, mathematics, philosophy, uh, geology, it just on and on, you know, the, the framework for science, for medicine, for philosophy, religion, you know, words like hymn and Eucharist all come out of Greek. You know, it, it's like a framework. And it continues to be a framework, not, in, not only in those spheres of knowledge, but in the way that Greek mythology shapes brand names, you know, like Ajax Cleaner. And, you know, we have the Olympics and we have all these yeah. frameworks or even just the narratives about heroes, you know, and the Greeks, as you know, really worshipped. They had literally hero worship. They had shrines <laughs> to these heroes. Yes, but then when you look at what who they're worshiping and you know what they've done according to the Greek mythological narratives, mm -hmm. and this is something I spin out in in the chapter in my book called Myths of Conquest, the heroes are rapists. Yes. the gods are rapists. They're mm -hmm. colonizers. They're conquerors. They're slavers. You know, they're pirates, yeah. and they take female captives. The prize of my sphere. Yeah. Right. Achilles, the prize of my sphere. He's referring to a, a woman that he captured in a raid yeah. as booty from from Lesbos. Yeah. And, you know, rapes her nightly in his tent. You know? yeah. So that's yeah. all in the Iliad and and in the other parts of the epic cycle. And yet we're taught all of this as this inspiring narrative, as this wonderful, you know, heritage 
without ever mentioning that aspect of it. It's just the wallpaper. It doesn't really show up. If you look at Greek vase painting, there's a lot of abductions of women. Yes. So the rape narrative is there, but they never actually show the act of rape. It's always him carrying her off and she's throwing her hands up in the air powerlessly, you know, and this was, it was not only a, a system of representation where rape is the base narrative, but it's also the actual making of these potter of this pottery, of this art, of sculpture for a market. There's a market demand right. for these stories of rape, right? Men are buying these pots for their symposia where the only women all allowed are enslaved prostitutes, right? performers and you know women are kept out of the main room in the house is called the androne mm -hmm. and it means the man's place and it's the best room the women aren't supposed to go in there men receive their guests and so all these men come and they drink together and the women are kept out and they don't get the same food either as the men yes and yeah. and so they're eating gruel up there in the women's quarters and then they can hear the men downstairs partying with the prostitutes and their buds you know and and it's you know when i say prostitutes that's not really right i mean they're enslaved the the the, the sex trade in greece was massive and it was entirely staffed by slaves yeah you yeah. know so you know there's all these angles to the way that the material reality the economics, the politics of Greek civilization is intertwined with the mythology, the way the mythology reflects and also promotes the values of these systems of domination. It, it's in, you paint. It's incredible the picture that you paint. Uh, I, I mean, I I walk in the ancient world a lot, but I never really think about it in the way that you've described it. And I think it's important that we think about it maybe more um, because I mean, you do, you know, you do, you kind of know the women's quarters are here and this, you, you know, that kind of stuff. But I, but this idea of putting this whole thing together, the food and the layers and the partying and the separation, especially among the Athenians. And it really, I, I, when I started your book, I thought, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to, you know, take my time through it. And I, I feel like your book, uh, Max, is like a rabbit, like you're falling through it. The more you read, the more you're like, wait, well, wait, yes. And then like you're like, I'm like, oh my God, yes. And oh my God. And so I feel like you're making these connections that are, I don't know. I mean, as a person that thinks I know stuff about the ancient Greek world, you know, I thought when I'm mm. reading, it was fascinating. I was like, yes, she's right. Yes, yes, you're right. Yes, you know. And so um, <laughs> I thought it was just wonderful. I mean, and devastating. But, yeah. for, you know, for readers to to really and when when you were talking about how they came without wives and they slaughtered the husbands and the brothers and the children, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not only did it remind me of very like uh, lions, you know, when lions do that and chimpanzees and things like that. But I thought like the the violent, the trauma, the generational trauma of that yeah, totally. for women. Right. You know, it was it was it was just a, like a brutal realization that it was like, yeah, this I don't I can't even imagine what that must have looked like. Groups and groups of women, you know, crying and vulnerable. And, about, and then, you know, you do tell some stories in which some women did try to sort of stand up and, and, and you know, take charge. And um, so but there's like, physical force. You know, yeah. so what do you do? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What do you do? What do you do? Exactly. What do you do? And I, you know, I've been reading a lot about Crete lately and sort of this Minoan Mycenaean uh, division, let's say, um, and mm -hmm. you talk about it a lot. Um, and I often think about Crete as, as a, when I think about Crete, I think about this image that you draw in the sense that the colonizer arrives and takes apart everything. Um, and yet there are so many women's traditions, like you say, that sort of seep mm -hmm. through, you sure. know, yeah, yeah, because conquest is not absolute and not. Yeah. The, the, I mean, there's the immediate force that lands on the society. And Crete, in many ways, was like a reservoir. It was protected from that by the sea for such a long time. Yeah. But um, I, I, I think initially in my in the 70s, when I was thinking about this, and I could see there's patterns of conquest and patriarchalization going on. 
it it seemed to me then that it was like this absolute takeover and it was in in a in many senses but there's also this way in which women's resistance as we know it can be very underground and it can be that transmission you know the the they they pass things on and then you do see what maria gimbutas talks about as the substratum culture there's mm -hmm. this, this dominating culture that comes over but the substratum there is is a spirit of resistance and language and symbols. The reason the goddesses were so important in the ancient Greek world was there was, this was something that persisted. They conserved it in spite of all of the severe patriarchal conditions that were imposed on them. You know, I'm talking about like that early proto-Greeks coming in and you have Indo-European invaders who become the rulers, their language becomes the dominant language. But the Mycenaeans uh, ethnically, you know, or genomically are not that different from the Cretans. And this is something that unfolded for me. A lot of this, what you said before, you know, I didn't know all of this either. And I kind of went down all these rabbit holes, which is why it took so long to get this book finished mm -hmm. because there was like putting these pieces together of a puzzle. And the way that we're taught about Greek civilization is mendacious. I guess is one way to put it, you know, that they're, there's, they concentrate, they shine spotlights on certain aspects that they can glorify, but they don't show you what the actual conditions are for the enslaved people, for the women confined in the houses. I'm going to talk about that more in, in book two, but yeah. um, especially in the way that the, the society and its mythology are presented to us in the academic narratives has actually been full of euphemisms for the rapes that are all embedded into this social structure. So when I was reading Robert Graves, and you know, this is really like a lot of feminists think, oh yeah, Robert Graves, you know, the goddess and all, but he, he like all these other scholars, yeah. and the further back you go, the worst it gets, you know, are full of euphemisms for rape. And, you know, and Zeus fell in love with X and Apollo loved Y. Yes. And, you know, whatever the name of the nymph or the woman or even the goddess is that they're about to rape. Yes. You know, they're using this language that actually covers over what the story's about. Yes. This conquest of women, you know, and these these narratives of subjugation. And so women seeing all of this, we get a partial picture of it. Mm -hmm. And it's enough to really demoralize every woman that reads it because we can't quite always put the, our finger on it, but something's wrong about this, you yeah. know? And they aren't giving you the full picture. So part of what I wanted to do, and I really didn't want to have to read the Iliad, which is just <laughs> like 10,000 verses glorifying bloodshed and, and conquest and the heroes <laughs> talking about their genealogy and giving these big speeches. I mean, you think this, this is a totally dramatic device in battle. You don't stand there and proclaim the deeds of your ancestors because you're they're going to whack your head off. But <laughs> you know that that's that's how they have it set up. It's all about the glory of of the warriors. And then you know the the story of the captivity of Briseis is actually pivotal pivotal to the Iliad. It's because. She's taken as a sex slave yeah. and it is in the custody. I mean, you know, is, is being raped by Achilles. And then the two top men, the top warrior Achilles and the king that's leading the whole Trojan War, Agamemnon, are fighting over her. Who gets to have her? And Achilles refuses to fight because Ag Agamemnon is able to take Briseis away from yeah. Achilles. And he even says, this will show you how I am more powerful than you. Yeah. And Achilles has a tantrum and a sulk and refuses to fight anymore. And the Greeks start to lose the war. And so eventually Agamem Agamemnon is forced to give Briseis back. Yeah. But her feelings in all of this, you know, and that of all the other female captains, they are so far in the background. And Helen herself, about whom this whole war is supposedly being fought, Right. The real purpose is to drag her back to her husband, who she has left. Right. And she has this love affair with a Trojan prince. But Helen is portrayed. It, it's so the sexual politics are just saturated in there. She, you know, it's she who is to blame for this terrible war and these nine years of slaughter and looting, you know. Right. And and she is made to say, you know, it's I, there's this concept that 
these two scholars, um, Lefkowitz and Fant, uh, Maureen Fant and, and um, can't think of her name, Lefkowitz. Anyway, they come up with this concept, men's words and women's mouths. So the men who are telling the story, the poets that are telling the story, uh -huh. the warriors that are telling the story are making, that they're framing everything and yeah. they put their interpretation, their words into the mouths, in this case of Helen. And she's talking about, oh, what a, what a terrible bitch I am. How shameful, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all of this, you know, it's my fault and I did all of this. While praising Agamem Agamemnon, who is actually leading the invasion. Oh, he's a good king but I am terrible. This is not, this is not the voice of Helen. This is the voice of the, the male poets who are actually, who are their customers? The aristocratic men who are paying them to sing these, these epics, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's a lot of that in there and we have to really dig to get a female perspective on it. But once we can actually name what's going on there for what it is, Everything turns around. Everything, the whole picture reconfigures. Yeah, because it's no longer a glorious thing. Do you think? And this is this is a question with no answer, but just your thoughts. Do you think that women? So there's a few schools of thought that I've come across. Do you think that women wrote things, and then those things were lost? Do you think that they, there's another, uh, one of my students was saying she had this theory that maybe women left symbolic meaning in things, thinking mm -hmm. future women would know what it means. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, this is one of our frustration, I think, looking back is trying to piece together what were women, for example, right. for me at Baron, what were women doing? I want to know yeah. the sort of, you know, and of course right. we don't have that information. And so the, the question, people have said to me, well, of course they wrote a lot of stuff and there's poets. And of course, I'm not saying they, they're not, but why, why have we not, other than Sappho's little bits and pieces and a few women right. here and there, like, what do you, like, what is your feeling about yeah. that? Well, I have many thoughts about this. One is that most women did not have access to the platforms of cultural production. Very okay. few women actually got educated to write. Mm -hmm. And we do have Aspasia, we have Sapfo, we have all of these. But actually, there's relatively few. And it's even worse when you get to Rome. Hardly any women writers have survived. So there were some, and definitely some were lost. And, you know, there are female philosophers and there are women who, who breach those boundaries. But um, so that's, that's kind of at the more elite level of culture, mm -hmm. because this is not a literate society in, in the main, you know, this is, we're, we're looking at all of that. And there were no women. I mean, women painted vases in the Neolithic, but this gets taken over by men. So all of the representational art, except for weaving, is being done by men in, right. you know, archaic and classical Greece, or even before Mycenaean times. But there's another layer, and this is something I try to tease out, although it's really um, it's really difficult because there's the oral tradition, right? Mm -hmm. So there's weaving, and, and, and I would talk about the story cloths of, of the women in, you know, the, this, this was really important in Greek civilization still, and the way that those were figuring in ceremony and uh, funerals and processions and the robes that were woven for the goddesses right. and all of that. So, yeah. so the weaving is important, and it's also a, a metaphor for creation and philosophy, and this whole thing about textile text. You know, the, the, I I have a whole section in the book that that talks about metaphors of spinning weaving uh, as uh, really the ground for, for literature and all these other you know things that become male dominated spheres. Right. But what we don't have in the main is we don't have the songs and litanies that women sang. And Sappho, she refers to this in her poems. She's always talking about the maiden's feet crushing the grass softly as they sing in rings around the altar of Artemis, you know, and, and she's constantly talking about women's dances and songs and ceremonies for goddesses. So that's that comes through very strongly. That's a testimony of a voice that could survive you know, and she was right. well regarded. The men liked Sappho actually, so she survived much better than others. And we have practically nothing from Arena, um, Corinna, some of the other women writers. But yeah, um, I think that we have to look into the sphere of women's ceremony to get a hint of what their world, world, worlds were, because they were transmitting their own stories, 
their own songs and invocations and litanies. And that's something that's just not within our reach anymore. But yeah. we do have one actual survival, which is really important. Because as you know, the word for the fates in Greek is the moire, yes. the apportioners, the one who give a lot of every being in life. And the the metaphor of them as spinners and all of that. Um, so there was a custom. Women's Greek men were constantly trying to quell and control women's funerary customs. This was an area that they retained not only the birth stuff but also the end of life. These life passages. Women still had their ceremonial worlds, mm -hmm. and they were constantly trying to limit what women did in their mourning ceremonies. One of the elements of those ceremonies is the moira logia. This literally means the speech or the words of the nor of, of the moire, of the fates. And mm. this is something that in spite of Christianization, in spite of the earlier classical Greek men's attempts to quell their mourning ceremonies, Greek rural women kept the custom of singing the moira logia at funerals all the way into the 20th century. Wow. Wow. Laura Shannon has gone into those village and met women who, who, you know, still do this. I mean, it's really, you know, modernization has really finally been a, maybe the final blow to that. But they would sing the life of the dead person, now an ancestor, and talk about their deeds and the bad as well as the good. And so this is something that persisted. And this is something important for us to know because we do hear so much about the conquest and, and the subjugation of women, but there is this very stubborn holding on to beloved customs that goes on. And, and the Moirologia is one example of that. Another one is that after Christianization, the, the clergy, the male, all male priesthood had a terrible time trying to force women to stop making their offerings at graves. Mm. And they would pour honey and oil and wine onto the grave in libation and, you know, speaking to the dead and singing to the dead. And that they would have undoubtedly at that time period still had actual litanies that were traditional to do and, and certain mm -hmm. rites, right? And, but the clergy in the seventh century, you know, long after, you know, Christianization had been, you know, for, enforced already at that time by centuries, they are still fighting to keep the women from doing this at the graves. And that wasn't true only of Greece. The same thing happened over much of Europe. So women wow. did hang on to to those things, but it's just very, very difficult to track them yeah. because we're dependent on mention by literate male writers to, you know, and for example, that piece of information comes from, uh, you know, records written by the clergy. And this is where we have a lot of our information about, you know, in the early middle ages and even later, about women's ceremonial activity under uh, mandatory Christianization is that the things that the men wrote to stamp that out inadvertently preserved evidence of what it was that they were actually doing. Yeah. And I talk about this quite a lot in my book, which is in pagans, because a lot of the source material for women's ceremonies is either canon law that the bishops pounded out in their synods or you know, just uh, councils and so forth that they held, um, the rulings that they passed, or or sermons, you know, yeah. decrying how the women were still going out to the woods and gathering herbs and singing over the herbs or whatever it may be. Yeah. So we can glimpse then, you know what? It wasn't all crushed at one moment. It survived. They held on to it and they secretly kept this stuff going. And after a while, the clergy knew that and they had to I mean, they didn't have to, but they went after it. They tried. They they persecuted systematically for so many centuries that it then morphs the women's customs into something more acceptable to their framework. So that's where the whole cult of the saints, goddesses in disguise, are smuggled in through the yeah. cult of the saints. And this was happening not only in Europe but also with Santeria, the African deities in the Caribbean, or the Maya gods and goddesses. In, in Guatemala under, you know, official Christianity. It's, 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 yeah, it's a bit overwhelming when you think about it. It reminds me in Crete, there's um, 
a cave of the wisdom of God, it's called, although I have a feeling that's not its original name. And uh -huh. uh, as you know, everywhere there's a sacred space, there's a little church and uh, it drives me a little nuts, uh, but oh. you know, with the Greek Orthodox church and all, all of them sort of, you know, I know that it's just a cave, but here's a church right at the top of it, just in case, you know? Uh, so they'll, in one, on the one hand they go, oh, it's just a cave, you know, it's nothing. And on the other hand, they'll, they go, well, we'll just put a little church here just in case, you know? Um, but in this church, in this little room, you would call it, there's a picture of the Virgin Mary. And then there are, the whole wall is full of women's hair bands, you know? Ah, yeah. And it would have been woven. But, and I'm just, and I mean, and it's like, like elastic max is like elastic hair it looks like every woman that made it up there and was wearing her hair in a ponytail felt <laughs> compelled to leave these like you know walmart like things you know oh there's, wow there's all <laughs> kinds yeah there's all kinds but there's like a bunch of these you know and i thought oh. what if and, and when i was in there i thought you know i'm gonna take off my hair tie too and leave it uh so the reason why i bring that up is because number one it's textile so over time, you lose textile pieces right, that are left. Right. right. Uh, but you have the elastic. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But number two, what a, what a it felt like when I was in there that there was a subtext that there was um, a message here, you know, and that that you could see the women that had come, mm. you know, so that there's that mystery sort of there. Uh, oh. In one way, it's very obvious. In another way, as a woman, you you get it. You're like, yeah. So this is our little, maybe a little revolution, a little leaving your stamp, you know. I um, think so because yeah. leaving your stamp, but also the hairband, the hair has vitality in it, True. and there's actually a direct connection of your body to this place that you leave your connection. You know, you have an energetic connection to that cave. You leave behind something that that you're related now to that sacred place yeah and and the name the the church of the wisdom of god sophia of course would have wisdom right yeah. so this is one of the major transmissions yeah. is what guys yeah. does goddess take in this in this you know transmogrification you yeah. know and and sophia was it and and there are lots of things woven together there because there's the element of the Hebrew chokhmah, the Hebrew influence on Christianity, right? right. Chokhmah is wisdom. And so there's a whole group of Gnostic scriptures around this. There's a whole group of Judaic mystic scriptures. Sophia and chokhmah are goddess, but you can't say goddess anymore. Yeah. So instead, right. and, and this happened really big also, especially the Orthodox church, not only the Greek, but also the Russian is you have, you know, the Holy Spirit is another one that, that becomes the female stand in. And you right. can't really say, you know, divine female anymore, but you just, these are, these are the, the markers for it. It's true. And actually that's been what my last episode was, or a couple episodes ago, I did this whole sort of rant on this idea of replacing the word goddess in the labels in museums. Um, and at oh, first, yeah. yeah. And at first I thought it was, you know, okay. You know, there's all kinds of reasoning in academia for it. Right. Uh, but this one last exhibition I was at, it was very clearly goddess that they're bird, you know, bird statues, bird goddesses. And it was like, this is a, a group of women sitting in a circle. And these represent the women in the village, you know, from 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and they're like, we don't have any like written text, but this is, you know, women, and it, the way it was worded anyways, it was so clear that we may be going through a, a backlash again, yes. as, you know, right, as goddesses, as women are, are becoming interested in this material. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I find that women are coming more, they always have been, but more and more coming to sort of learn more about the goddess, learn more about history, learn more about stuff. And as this is happening, I can see it simultaneously in academia. Well, we don't want to apply, you know, any. Um... It's being negated. Right. They're, they're very keen to negate it. And they have all kinds of abstruse reasonings as to why that's a good thing. You know, it's more exactly. accurate to, to, to negate it. It's, you know, reframings. And, and there's a lot of that that's been going on. You know, I mean, they never really liked this. I mean, even in women's studies in the 70s, they would kind of like, um, you know, make the warding off sign if anybody talked about goddess or matriarchy, it was very threatening because they yeah. knew that in 
academia, the larger academia that they were trying to get purchase in to get a foothold, that was just anathema, yeah. you know? And I, and I use that church term deliberately because there is this way that academia came out of the cathedral schools, which were all male. Yes. In, yes. In the Middle Ages, that's the origin of it. So there's these ways in which even though, you know, with the so-called enlightenment, they jettisoned a lot of the religious doctrine, they did not in the least leave behind the patriarchal doctrine yeah you know and so you have this more rationalistic form of patriarchy you know and yeah. i think that postmodern uh discourse has really been a way to to alienate very vital vibrant connections that women are making and we can see things we can see the symbols we can feel them they resonate with us and it's yeah. like no 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 you can't have that yeah, we don't want to do that. You know, we're going yeah. to give you all kinds of new reasons why that is really just not advisable, you know. Yeah. So it, it is yeah. it is a backlash. You're you're absolutely right. And I, uh, I guess a part of me is disappointed. I mean, when I was getting my PhD, there was a lot of resistance to, you know, you have to you propose the books you're going to read and the first time and the second time and blah, blah. And, uh, and they would go through those books and take out a lot of the goddess feminists early yep. feminine it would just be like no no this is too woo woo this is right, too right. dated um and you know well, you love have to make it be dated <laughs> right i mean and you have... is never dated Could you imagine? never dated you know <laughs> yeah and and it was it was tough i mean you in a way you have to obey to get through the process yep. mm -hmm. but and then once I was free, so to speak, and I had my own, then I could go back and, and talk about these women. But in a way, it's also very frustrating because, of course, they, what they're doing is they are funneling you into a certain way of thinking totally. and shaming you kind of and, mm -hmm. and putting you down a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, it's exclusionary of yeah. feminist points of view. Yeah. You know, I mean, they don't do that to the dominant religions. You know, if there's a source that is taking true a christian or a jewish or a muslim standpoint that's viable but something that's this insurgent feminist attempt to reclaim whole yeah. areas of cultural study that have been basically ruled out for millennia can't have that yeah i think you're so you're absolutely right and 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 i'm so glad that this is still going on in the sense that the women women are still interested for me one of the things that i'd like to do and and i think you're your book just just reiterates that like in the sense of reinforces that I'm on the right path is you know continue providing women with artifact evidence and obviously all we have is material culture um of all of the things that we were of the times that we were in power and I'm wondering if maybe you want to from you know from your book I know you talk about there was sort of this time now do you think that there was a time and I'm maybe a jumping subjects here but do you think there was a time of matriarchy or is my impression from what you're saying is that people were living with priestesses and goddesses, maybe not a full matriarchy, and then these other people came in and took over? What do you think? Like, do you think there was a yeah. time when women were ruling in a way? Yeah, yeah you know, I think that that's still the patriarchal paradigm, rulership. Mm, okay? Yes, yes. It's, it's like the right. self-determination of women, uh, women's authority women as culture makers women as spiritual leaders yep. as um as priestesses certainly as healers as clan mothers you know getting back more to indigenous models so here here's what i think about your question i think we're looking at layers upon layers upon layers mm -hmm. of domination and it it's like i said before it doesn't all happen at once it's a yeah. process so, you know, one thing that we're looking at, the Proto-Greeks come in maybe estimating around 2200 BCE, somewhere in that range. The, 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 these people who are speaking this language that's most closely related to Armenian, they're coming from that direction, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's pretty late in the overall frame of what we're reconstructing about Europe from the Neolithic. I mean, in the Neolithic era, we're looking at village societies, where women are cultural creators, the whole old Europe framework that that Gimbo just laid out so so eloquently, you know, mm -hmm. that's the ground in which we're looking at matriarchal culture, where you know there's not a domination system, there is loads of beautiful art and ceremony going on. I mean, the art is just full of information about the kind of 
a spiritual orientation that they had and the mother pots and the spirals and all of these things integrated in their farming, you know, their, 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 this way in which the spiritual and the technological or the economic are completely integrated. And something that we can see, for example, in indigenous societies in North America, where when women go to dig the clay, they sing to the clay mother. You know, this kind of culture is, is existing in Europe at that early period. But we do have more and more information about these invasions, these overlays, the Indo-Europeanization of Europe that took place, which we know from linguistics initially, there's a patriarchal framework in those cultures. They have kings, they have warlords, they have social classes, they have uh, patrilineal and patrilocal marriage. And, you know, the aspects of male domination come through in some of the early sources like the Hittites or, you know, the Sanskrit sources, whatever, the Greeks. Yeah. But so here we have, we have um, in the Mycenaean era, we have a mixture because we see a patriarchal society, a class rank society, slavery, all of this is happening. And yet there are still priestesses. There are goddesses are very important. The early temples, a little bit right. later period are to Hera and to other goddesses. So that there's this way in which the magnetic field of the matri culture is still very much at work, even under this new Indo-Europeanized uh, society or new, I mean, you know, it's going on for a couple thousand years, a couple, you know, centuries right. by that time. Right. Um, so layer upon layer is taking place and we can even see shifts from the beginning of the archaic period where, you know, we can't necessarily even name the goddesses. We can see the iconography, but yeah. we can't really say, oh, that's Hera, that's Athena. Not yet. I yeah. mean, that begins to come into view during the archaic. And who knows what the stories were then? Because we yeah. have very few archaic sources. We have Kizia, we have Alcman, some other sources I talk about. Yeah. And that's where our knowledge of the Greek mythology comes from, is those oldest sources. And that's what I'm really drawing on in chapter one. When I talk about the Titanides, the female Titans, who are the powers of nature, there, yeah. there's a very different sexual politics in that mythology than in the Olympian. So we're looking at layers even within a relatively late historical period uh, where, you know, and, and I track this in Myths of Conquest, the way the goddesses are done down, or actually the chapter three is called goddesses, uh, what's it called? Goddesses revised, I think. Yeah, I think. yeah. Yeah, because we can actually track in the textual sources the way that the goddesses become more patriarchalized and more subjugated. In yeah, certain ways. yeah, and I mean, and, I and of so course, we can watch that in real time. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's true. It's and I, of course, I, I, I digested your Artemis section right away because I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and that's one of the things that um, I think is so important for us to do is to is to work on re reminding people or maybe bringing back this idea that actually what we have, like you say, what we have now, and even what we had a thousand years ago, and even what we had 2000 years ago is not what we had four or 5,000 years ago, as far as, you know, goddesses and the right. way they worship, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and, and so this is kind of, you know, I think there's, there's two things that are really useful concepts. One is pattern recognition. We can say, all right, you know, we keep seeing this with the women weavers, not only in European civilization, but in others, you know, and the way that's linked to cosmology and to ceremony, including life passages, you know, in places like Borneo, where the cloths that women weave are used in all the life passage ceremonies, you know, so there, there's the pattern recognition, but then there's also the, the understanding that patriarchy or all forms of di domination really are historical processes. They're not original to humanity. I mean, we will look at the Paleolithic. Their iconography is overwhelmingly the great mother. Yeah. You know, even the grandmothers, you know, not Venus, but yeah. grandmothers, right? Yeah. And and so, you know, the whole stereotype about cavemen dragging women by their hair, you know, right. is is a modern construct because actually, no, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. I mean, even cavemen is kind of like, what? but um. If you look at patriarchal historical process, you can see how these layers are lowered over the culture and begin to embed themselves. And you can see the resistance to it, including through goddess culture. This remains a reservoir of women's values and, and arts and creation and, and ceremony. Yeah. And 
So um, that what we see paradoxically in Greece is this very intense contrast uh, and combination of male domination, aristocratic domination, uh, you know, conquering and slaving. Those things are going on in the Myc Mycenaean societies. Yeah. Nevertheless, there are very powerful priestesses. There are these goddess temples. There is this whole culture going on that is shared with the, it's like, almost like the roots of the society, the base, the peasantry, who's feeding everybody, who's really actually what everything is living off of, off of women's labor, off of the common people's labor and the enslaved people's labor. That is that is really where the the vital source is and it keeps bubbling up. And so, you know, you have these powerful temples to Zeus and the male heroes and there's all of this stuff is happening because that is the orientation of the rulers. But you also have being fed by the wellsprings of, of folk culture and especially from the women. Yeah. You have this rich goddess orientation that is nature loving. I mean, I loved it when I really kind of got into writing about the nymph fight because the nymphs, you know, we, and again, this is the distortion. This, it's not that this didn't begin in the Greek civilization. You have the gods raping the nymphs and you have this whole idea of nymphs as these sexually available, lovely ladies who are, you know, just really kind of vulnerable and have no real power of their own. But yeah. in the women's side of it, the women's culture, the nymphi govern all the passages of life and death. They go to them like they were in the caves in Crete that you're talking about. They're yeah. going to the caves in Greece, which are often wellsprings. And they're dancing there and they're making offerings and they're praying for a good birth and for conception. They're praying for the ancestors. There's all these things that continued along almost out of view historically. But we have these traces, which I've attempted to assemble together in this book to show people, wait, no, there are these traces. And it shows us a whole understructure of what, what was going on with most people. And yeah. especially at the center of that, the women, you know, so the, the nymphion. The, the sanctuary of the nymph is very different than the Olympian domination or what they call the Panhellenic culture, right? Yeah. This is also Panhellenic, but in a different sense. This is the deep roots that are shared. And these, these, these sanctuaries, they might not even have buildings. They might just have an outdoor altar right. next to a rock, next to it, within a grove, you know? Right. And this is how the temples grew up. Initially, there's just this altar, you know, yeah. and, and, or there's this cave, you know, or there's this peak sanctuary and everything follows along after that. And we can trace these layers upon layers until finally it's being transformed into Christian saints, you know, or, or holy wisdom or whatever name changes it all undergoes, yeah. but women continue going to that place. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's very interesting to look at the modern Greek folklore because you have the nay raids are still being revered and talked about. And they're saying, well, yes, that's over there by that cave. That's where the Nairids are dancing. You know, the, the goddesses of the sweet waters, you know, or, or you know, that's actually the, the Nyads. But anyway, um, there's, there's this continuity that happens or the exotica, which is another interesting thing. The, the women from outside, the, the Sicilians have this concept too. So in the peasant culture, in modern times, the women are still talking about fairy women under these various names, mm. you know, those women over there somewhere that are out in nature, you yeah. know, and, and we don't want to offend them, you know, uh, you know, in many indigenous societies, illness originates because you, you insulted some divinity of, you know, animacy, right. the goddess of the spring, you stepped on the plant or whatever it is you did. And so, you know, in Korea and in so many different parts of the world, the ceremonies are to set things to rights again. And once yeah. you do this, then the ancestors are no longer going to be offended and you will recover from your illness or the city will finally, the plague will lift, whatever it is that's going on. So it, it's interesting to see, then this is what I mean by pattern recognition, is to see the commonalities in European civilization. Right. It, it, at that base layer of common people, not those upper, you know, dominant layers uh commonalities of european women's culture with the rest of the world 
it, it reminds me, you remind me of a story uh, that's a friend of mine's story uh, at Canasso's when she went and it was like one of these December days when no one was there. And she loves telling the story because she stopped to talk to some of the women who were, you know, uh, taking the tickets or whatever. There was empty mm -hmm. and uh, they just started talking, whatever. And the women, one of the ladies there had said to her, or maybe it was in the gift shop somewhere, had said to her, you know, uh, whenever there's no one here, we ask the guards or we can ask the guards to go sit on the on the what they call the throne room. Um, and the belief is among the women, because only women are allowed to sit on it, she said. That was her story. Um, uh -huh. that you could sit on it and make a wish, you know, mm -hmm. and that the wish came true. And it reminds me. Wow. Of, yeah, it's and I was like, that's an amazing story. Like that's so, a continuity. Right. Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And she goes, yeah, we don't tell, you know, don't tell anybody because, you know, whatever. But like when, you know, there's nobody there. And I thought I would love to spend more time, I mean, I mean to, with locals to share. But I mean, these are things that come up randomly. You know, you can't really plan yeah. them, right? Because right. They get women get a little protective of their stories too, right? Like they don't want somebody going, oh, tell us what you do when no one's here. Right, you know? right, right. Um, but it reminds me of the way that mystery gets passed down even today. Mm hmm you know, um, and even at, you know, Knossos, I mean, I once posted a, a, a one minute or 30 second video saying that perhaps there was no king and there was no monarchy at Knossos. And it went crazy. People went nuts. People were mm -hmm. in there going, oh, but what about King Minos? And uh, what do you know? And how are that you? That was a Greek that? story. <laughs> it's not a Cretan one. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, it was good in a way to raise awareness, but it was you are bombarded by people who have these assumptions that are now right. so ingrained in right. patriarchal assumptions right. that anything you say is, uh, you know, I get a lot of like, what qualifies you to say this? And I thought, well, right. you know, just read, but um, <laughs> yeah, but the, so there's this, but that being said, I think there's a lot that I know there's a movement now to not say Minoans anymore, to say Cretans, which is kind of like there's a movement to slowly push back against yes. Arthur Evans. And I'm very much with this. I don't use Minoan. Yeah. I mean, that was that was, you know, Evans yeah. came up with that. And the whole the whole Minoan story is a Greek. It's actually a pejorative story about Crete. Mm -hmm. When you look at it, you know. Yeah. And and it's the Greeks that were doing this, the human sacrifice, you yeah. know, so. I mean, there's just there's just so many embedded narratives in in the way that all of that gets framed. So yeah, I go with Crete. So I'm I'm happy to hear the Cretans are also um, doing that because I just came up with that um, independently, and I think a lot of this works that way. As yeah. you can see, there's a good reason why not to continue uh, perpetuating these these same frameworks. Yeah, you know? yeah, and actually, that's like re-indigenizing me... Crete. Yes, 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 exactly. That brings me to a question, actually, that I had on here uh, when you talk about Ariadne. I've been mm -hmm. fascinated with her lately. Um, I guess for a long time, she seemed like a minor figure. And now, I guess because mm -hmm. I spent so much more time on that island, uh, do you do you think that uh, Ariadne, I mean, I don't, and again, this is sort of just a in, in your research, uh, more of a goddess figure that was then sort of turned into a girl? by the Mycenaeans telling the story like do you think that she that she's one of these goddesses that had a, a larger longer more important history and then ended up being minimized into this yeah you know um you know I think that there's a couple possibilities one is that she's a goddess and the other is that she is a legendary uh record of priestesses mm. because she's a dancing priestess and if you look at the at the, the Cretan seals ecstatic dance is just massive yeah. it's just like it's a major major theme running throughout cretan art and so you know that it's like this there's this modern separation of there's the dancer and then there's the religious leader but that kind of distance did not exist in the old culture and ecstatic dance so she we, our oldest record of ariadne uh well first not really because there's linear b records of uh, that name shows up in there i think uh, Gregory Nagy talks about the etymology of Ariadne, the Ari, like, you know, the, the ultimate, the excellent, right? That, that Greek word Ari, um, which it appears an aristocrat and a lot of other, you know, but, but, yeah. you know, we have, um, he, he derives that Adni apparently is a Cretan pronunciation of Agne, 
which means holy. So his, this is a very eminent Harvard uh, Hellenist, okay? He derives the, the name Ariadne as meaning the most holy. So it could Amazing. be a goddess or it could be her priestess, right? And, you know, on, on the favor of the goddess side is the pairing with Dionysus. So mm -hmm. she's the partner of Dionysus. Right. But there's kind of a distance with them, even in the oldest records. You know, there's this whole thing in the Iliad, which I was about to say is the oldest, but it isn't really. Uh, but it's, it's it's the oldest Greek source at any rate. Right. Uh, written Greek source. Um, she's called Ariadne of the Lovely Locks, and it refers to her dancing ground. And so she is like a guardian of the labyrinth who in the yeah. Greek narrative betrays her entire culture, her, her charge as a priestess to Theseus, however you say that name, I'm not even sure. Yeah, um, I say Theseus, but who knows? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, probably I should just say Theseus for recognition for purposes. <laughs> but anyway, you know, she, she takes him into the labyrinth to kill her brother, the Minotaur, and then he uh, seduces her and takes her out and immediately abandons her. So there's this whole tragic patriarchal narrative about Ariadne in, in the Greek stories. And Theseus is the heroic center figure. But again, it's a conquest. Theseus. Right. And but but here's one of the things that happens is that she teaches him the Geranos dance, which is like a spiral dance. It's a winding dance that became associated, was first associated with Crete and the labyrinth. That's its point of art origin. But then mythologically, they transfer it over to Theseus. He abandons Ariadne on the island. And he goes to Delos, which is like the sacred island for the Greeks going back a long way. And he teaches the Delians the Geranos. So it, it becomes now in male hands in a sense. But nevertheless, this is a very sacred ancient Aegean dance. And so that's an important piece. But the point is that the origin of the dance is from Ariadne. So you have two different strands of mythology in which she is the dancer. And she's the guardian of the labyrinth, which... Although we think of it as a maze, and I talk about this in the book, is actually probably a reference to the vast temple complex at Knossos. Yeah. Right. So there's that part of it. And then another part of it is in the Iliad, the way that this, the other reference to her there is that um, she is the wife of Dionysus and he bears witness against her because she has this affair with Theseus and has Artemis slay her. Yeah. That's a horrible piece. Um, <sighs> you know, so there, there's a, there's a lot of lies embedded into this, but anyway, yeah. the idea is that Dionysus is the jealous husband who punishes his wife for infidelity. Right. Yeah. And that, might be an older Greek story, but the thing about it is that it gets transformed mythically mm -hmm. later because the women didn't like this. They liked the romantic narrative of Dionysus and Ariadne, and they become like the divine yeah. couple with the happy marriage. And yeah. he becomes the very considerate and loving husband. And this is what survives and it spreads over the entire Mediterranean yeah. as far as Spain in one direction and then all the way deep into Central Asia to Afghanistan where you have these little golden pieces of ornaments showing Ariadne in a chariot or riding on a tiger along with uh, Dionysus. Yeah. So her myth undergoes various transformations, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, it's I think to me, I mean, obviously to me, I'm, I'm less interested in the heterosexual romance part and more interested in the, uh, her original character as, you know, and, and maybe even the goddess as dancer could be a piece of that, but she is the figure who's in charge of the temple. Here's the other piece though. She's the daughter of Pasiphae, right. who herself is a Titanis. She's one of the old deities. Yeah. You know, the, in Greek, they're called the, the Proteroi Theoi, the, the former gods, the earlier gods. And so, you know, this is, this is the original matricultural uh, pantheon of the, the nature yeah. divinities. And so in that sense too, Ariadne is a goddess because she's the daughter yeah. of a goddess. That's true. And then Pacify okay. is also diminished because she's told we're right. told she falls in love with a bull and has sex with a bull and blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's a whole sexual degradation of her. And also she right. is a sorceress and, you know, she's a bad witch. 
Right. So, you know, there's this demonization of the powerful women of Crete that, that's happening. And of course, Kirke is, I have to I have to remember my genealogy. Kirke, I think, is the sister of Pasiphae. Is that how it goes? I think so, yeah. Her I father forget. is Helios. Yeah, well. I think Ariadne yeah. would be the niece of, yes. of Kirke yeah. or Circe, you know, say in English. Uh, and then Medea, in turn, is her cousin. Yes. So these are all highly demonized, not Ariadne herself so much, but her mother and her, her cousin and her aunt are all demonized as powerful women who are therefore transformed from goddesses into witches. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about that a lot in, in yeah. book two. It's yeah. It's so important to do this work. It, it, it feels sometimes it feels a bit. So sometimes I feel like how much can I say about, you know, Artemis and some of the other goddesses that I sometimes like, and then this whole thing opens up where there's just so much more to share. <laughs> exactly. There's right? so much more there. And that, that's why, I mean, I just kept going down my rabbit holes. I was like, oh my God, you know, cause I kept trying to wrap up the book and it like, you know, I thought I would finish it in two years and it took seven. And that was when a bunch of it was already written, but I ended up having to read all of the, of the key source material, Yeah, you know, because I was starting with secondary sources and then I found they left things out and I really had to go back and look at the original sources and really track the you know i mean there there's a whole level to this and this is going to sound really intellectual to people but it's it's historiography it's yeah. the way things are written and tracking it and seeing the transformations of the stories that happen because what's being written in hesiod is really different than what comes up later in, in later sources you know right. and the way that they treat it and so you see a diminution of of women's power that is constantly being enacted you know, in these later iterations, like the Orphic literature is, is really yeah. big on that, you know, that you see, you know, more and more of a demonization of, of female power or it's direct colonization. And, and I was, I, I went off into a whole thing of reading Martin West's stuff. He's a philologist, British philologist, who really an expert on Indian Indo-European studies, as well as Hel Hellenic stuff. Wow. And, you know, the way that so many of these Orphic cosmologies were derived from, especially West, West Asian ones that had, uh, basically the theme coming across was, we're going to displace goddess and the ultimate creator has to be a male god. Yeah. And so I, I talk about that in the myths of conquest uh, chapter, because there's this way in which you have this theme of male birth. Yes. The goddess as the great mother is displaced and yeah. you have the, the Zeus gives birth to two different, you know, to Athena first from yeah. his head and then Dionysus later from his thigh, you know, and, and so there is the displacement. And ultimately, although the Greeks all knew that these, these older divinities, they have a story of the overthrow of the Titans by the Olympians. There's a war that's fought. And so the Olympians are Victorian, victorious, and this is the new patriarchal order, right? But they, even go further than that later because they knew that the titans were the original deities they were the parent generation so you know rhea is one of the titan generation along right. with chronos and her children are the olympians and so the olympians overthrow that order yeah but they still know that earth is earth heaven is heaven you know all of these these nature powers have, have their forms what the orphics do is they take this asiatic story that begins with the hittites and they have Zeus, Zeus swallow the entire universe into himself, thereby incorporating it into him. And then he vomits it back out. So instead of a male birth, he's actually vomiting it because he doesn't actually have a way to physically give birth wow. in that sense. And that is like a, a mythical device which makes him the origin he has to swallow it and then vomit it out. And this is symbolically some kind of a birth. And so therefore he's the father of everything. Yeah. Wow. A neat little trick. It, I mean, it's the same with, you know, uh, the Judeo-Christian, you know, monotheistic myth, right? Like uh, God thinks, right? And out of nothing, his thoughts, that's how he creates, mm. you know, or he makes with his hands, Adam and all that. The hijacking of that, uh, the hijacking of the birthing of both physical mm -hmm. birthing and idea birthing and all, all the other kinds of birthing is something that I think we, we need to just keep mentioning and discussing. Uh, Cause I'm yeah. not sure that everyone's that clear on it. Like sometimes when you show it to people, they go, oh, right. 
but I'm not sure. Like, it's almost like this has to be a foundational learning that we've been brainwashed to accept that male gods can birth, you yeah. know, in these, whatever, these grotesque ways that they can birth things. And so then yeah, masturbation is also in there. You know, you have uh, Egyptian and West Asian gods, they masturbate or even Indic gods in India, Prajapati, you know, masturbates and, you know, gives rise or becomes this, the seed, his seed becomes the origin. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like pattern recognition is still really important with this in order to see the overall structure of what, you know, it's just like, it's not just one story, but it's a whole group of stories in which they do this process of uh, mythically subjugating female. Yeah. You know, and, and the negation, once again, of 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 birth giving, you know, uh, in many male initiation ceremonies around the world, they do imitation birth. And so, you know, this whole thing of being born again with Christians is one example of it. Right. But, you know, in, in some aboriginal societies, the, the young boy and, you know, the boys that are becoming men have to crawl between the legs of the mm -hmm. father generation. So it's like a symbolic birth. And because they they don't have a menarche, they have to shed blood. So there is some kind of symbolic wounding, whether it's male circumcision or what some other form of bloodshed to yeah. indicate this passage for them. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, this appropriation of female power in a, in a symbolic way. It's fascinating. I read something by um, these Barbara Mann and Karina Kylo. They, they wrote this book about women and bears. But one of the things that they said that you reminded me of is that before the last ice age or whatever, they may have been a time where the only bleeding or even further back, the only bleeding uh, that was done was, you know, menarche blood, let's say. And then once people started hunting and killing things that then the sort of masculine blood, the hunt blood, the violent blood becomes the valuable sort of heroic life giving because you're feeding the tribe. So the, the shift, you know, psychologically and spiritually and all this kind of ways begins with this sort of idea, which I thought was, I never, you know, yes, we know that men bleed in ritual because they can't bleed otherwise. But I was thinking about that, like the difference between sort of the way that a violent kind of blood versus a, a body. Giving right. Blood, right. You know? Yeah. I, I don't agree about hunting and that. I think that humans uh, hunting is very old and especially in the ice age, you know, with some of our early records of human culture yeah. is, you know, they had to hunt because ecologically that was how you were going to, I mean, there wasn't a lot of, you weren't growing stuff. Sure. You weren't able to grow crops. Right. But, uh, yeah. It's, it's um, that was something that I discovered late in my process as I had this book I came across, uh, Nancy, Nancy J, hmm. very important feminist thinker. And she wrote this book about how sacrifice and particularly the shed of shedding of blood in sacrifice is completely correlated to paternity, to patrial lineage. Huh. And she just a fascinating study. She does this cross-cultural span. And it's like how women in most societies, not all, there's some exceptions in Africa, for example, Right. blood sacrifice was a male sphere you know and so that was how men did ceremony and that was how they established a bond it's like you know literally a covenant in a way you know when yeah. you look at circumcision in the Hebrew tradition yeah. that um you know in in place of sacrifice uh, in place of human or animal sacrifice then instead you're cutting male genitals and making them bleed and this and is the offering it, it reminds me uh, and but, but, but that's a father line right Right. It reminds me of when you talk about Orthea and Sparta, and it reminds me of the custom that they had where they were bleeding themselves, uh, you know, for Artemis, and they would be like whipping themselves or whatever to bleed on the statue of Artemis. And I think you're, you're absolutely right that they that, that this was a bonding. So this was a bonding, but also sort of like a like whoever was the last man standing or one of the last man standing, there's like a pride for the family. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people right. were witnessing these things. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think that there's something there with the bleeding of men that creates that bond for them. And also this, this sense that it's sacrificial blood, like um, yep. I'm giving my blood in a painful way to yeah. this deity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so Nancy J talks about that. Another one is there's a Marxist anthropologist, Chris Knight, and he talked, he's a book called Blood Rights, where mm -hmm. he gives multitudinous examples of exactly what you just said wow. really interesting, interesting. yeah so 
Yeah. Um, you know, and then we go back to the, the matricultural forms, which, you know, the Eleusinian mysteries, the mystery yeah. of the resurrection of the grain, you know, and it's all about farming in that context. So that's really a Neolithic culture. And what's really interesting, and this is not my observation, but many scholars have noted that in the Neolithic, they already had the kernos, the offering vessel with the many little cups on it. Mm -hmm. This yeah. predates Greek culture by a long way. So here again, we have another lineage of transmission that comes out of the deep, the ancient kindreds, the pre-Indo-European kindreds. And it was in Aegean archaeology. It was in mainland Greece and in Crete too. Mm -hmm. And then it is something that is carried along and becomes associated with this later form of goddess veneration in, um, you know, Demeter and Persephone. Right. Wow, Max, that is, that is, so that is a lot. I feel like we're just scratching the surface of things. Uh, and you probably hear that a lot um, because I think that people, I've had a few people who I've posted that I'm going to be talking to you and they were like, oh my God, I've got the book and uh, I'm very excited for them to, to read it. Um, what, what, what would you like how would you how would you like this book to be received you think like what if you could pick you know what would people what would people get out of it do you think yeah well yeah. i think of it as a source book it's not mm -hmm. the kind of book you're going to sit down and read overnight it's dense because i'm just trying to bring the information i'm trying to reconstruct from the available information whether it's archaeological mythical linguistic historical all of that yeah. kind of like retie together the story yeah. that has been spun off into all these different directions so that there are no connections anymore. I want to see what the connections are, you know? And, and so there's many of them because it's like, well, the whole ethnic narrative and the whole linguistic, you know, there, there's just many aspects of it, but I want what I wanted to know, you know, when I began this research, what I was looking for was evidence of prepatriarchal societies, women's ceremonial and political leadership or freedom even you know yeah. of 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 goddess veneration what was that really like you know to try and kind of uh, re-grasp what what that cultural world was about you know yeah. what was lost in a sense you know um and so you need information and there's been i have to say a lot of fantasizing that has gone on and it's not fantasizing is not bad but you have to be careful about what you present as historical fact you know and, you know, so, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, what I'm doing here is provisional. I mean, maybe if I continue for another 10 years, I'd find more information about this, but I'm done. With the <laughs> for now. You know, but it's just like to find authenticated information as opposed to the purely speculative. For example, Robert Graves in invented this concept of maid maiden mother crone. Yes. And a lot of women take that as absolute gospel of what goddess religion is and even for Greece, that isn't really, I mean, you do have all these triads of goddesses, yes. you know, whether in the European cultures at large or even globally, that's, that's a real thing. There's the three, but then there's also the seven and the nine, you know, we can go off into that symbolic. Right. So um, we, we have to be a little bit careful about that because, you know, in, in reality, those weren't necessarily age graded in, in the Greek society. There's lots of threes and nines, you know, the muses and various group things like that yeah but um we, we it would be a mistake i think to say oh this is what goddess religion is it's made mother grown you know okay. and, and so i think it's a process of growing because we're all trying to recover this knowledge mm -hmm. and we do have the right to interpret i'm not saying that at all i just want it to be more authentic and this wasn't also an issue with my book which is in pagans women in european folk religion I wanted to know what the authentic ancestral heritages were for yeah. women of European descent, because there's all this crap out there that's being published, you know, that is like Celtic Wicca or whatever, you know, it's like Wicca is right. Anglo-Saxon, has nothing to do with the Celts, you know, right. <laughs> except that they're both Indo-European. But, right. you know, I want, it's so easy to take down, I mean, with all the attacks on goddess reverence, you know, and, and the, you know, the negation and the degradation of it by uh, the pejoration of it by the Christian establishment has now been replaced by an academic uh, disdain for it, 
you know, and and uh, stigmatization even of it. Yeah, that is not really valid, but it they, it's very easy for them to discount it because when women go off on these tangents about you know things that may, are not historically accurate, it makes their job very easy. But there yeah. really is a real case to be made and a reconstruction to be recreated yeah. of heritages that were in very political manner done down and you know the 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 repression and the persecution of any form of spiritual practice by women and around women the divine female is something that you know it's a point of attack and it has been for a very yeah. long time in yeah. you know various patriarchal cultures so that uh, we we need that recovery. We need that cultural recovery work very much, but it's a process. And so, you know, what I'm trying to do is draw together some of the really juicy good stuff, as well as, you know, having a very um, realistic eye on the ways that that was repressed by dominance culture, patriarchal culture, men silencing women you know in, in very basic ways and cutting off you know you know you can't go to this place anymore and do these ceremonies you know there were these all these stages of that process that brought us to where we are now and so we're left really with a spiritually impoverished uh thin upper layer upper crust that covers what once was so that that's my aim and you know in the larger series uh, I, I'm going to talk in the next volume. This is volume two of my series, Secret History of the Witches. So uh, it got out of hand. Once it was over 800 pages, it had to get broken <laughs> into two books. And I didn't really set out to do it that way, but it was just so much material. I mean, the literature on Greece is vast. Yeah. And that's why it took me so long to plow through it. But, yeah. um, you know, the, the volume two is going to look really more at the historical structure of Greek patriarchy. Wow. You know, especially in the archaic and classical periods, going into the Hellenistic as well. You know, what what was that like? How was it set up? How did it work? Right. You know, the status of wives and concubines and slaves, you know, how it was enforced. And uh, then I go to the priestesses. Then I go to uh, the views of barbarian women, this whole Hellenic men looking out at women in other parts of uh, other countries and saying, well, wow, those women are not subjugated like ours are. And what is that all about? Right. Well, they're, they're Amazons, they're witches, they're barbarians, you know, they're, they're really weird. They're not like us, but those stories are a really interesting reflection of two things. One attitudes of Greek men that shapes the whole thing. Right. But two also, well, this is very interesting what they're saying about women in Lydia or women in North Africa, you know, that they, these women are more free. And they mythologize that, either as Amazons or whatever it may be. And so I look at those stereotype narratives and kind of dig under them. Uh, the women of Lemnos especially is very interesting. This is an island near Les Lesbos that was very much in the Greek mind associated with female sovereignty and female rebellion. Hmm. So, so the myth is that you know the, the women of Lemnos killed all their husbands, and then they had a, a land of women. And the Argonauts come, Argonauts come along and they have sex with those men and blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of stories. But anyway, there right. was a horror. The Greek men had a horror of Lemnian women. It was a stereotype of the, the witchiest, most rebellious women that could be, you know, and they invented these stories. And these were also a way of keeping Greek women down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Then I talk about Amazons because this is a really big part of that mythologization. Yeah. So you know, here again, the academic stances, well, there weren't ever really any Amazons. I know. And, um, well, it depends what you say the Amazons are. I think Adrian Mayer's contribution in her book, The Amazons, she really pulled together the documentation, both literary and also archaeological, and showed there were actually women warriors yeah. in the steppe and in Western Asia. You mm -hmm. know, And it doesn't mean that they were necessarily living in a matriarchal society at that time we're, we're talking about the iron age after all you know we have already had the bronze age there's a lot of patriarchy there's a lot of war and subjugation that have preceded this but women in those societies were some of them were warriors priestesses mm -hmm. hunters you know yeah and so greek men took that and ran with it and they mythologized about it but what mayor brings forward is really important because she shows that the later um uh, face paintings especially not the very earliest ones 
which show these women warriors as basically like Greek helots, you mm. know, the, the male warriors with the helmets. Yeah. But the later paintings really reflect the actual dress of step women or of step people, right? right? And not only that, but she shows that their methods of hunting, like the eagle hunters, she shows that that's, that that's something that's still found in Central Asia and Mongolia, mm -hmm. uh, actually already existed, was being documented by Greek artists for the Amazons, that the type of quivers that they w use are found in historical uh, excavations of women warriors, wow. the sagaris, not a double axe, but a single blade axe with a spike on the other end, which was mm. an Amazon uh, attribute in Greek art, actually exists in oh. in burials. And so she's saying, well, wait, you know, there is a historical reality here. The Greeks did mythologize about it, but there's something out there also that we have to try and reconstruct. And if we look at the burials of Sarmatian women, yeah, very strong contrast with Greek women. They're out there in public. They are wearing these glorious headdresses. They have their own massive tombs. I mean, there's this one mound called um, uh, Bolshoya Bliznitsi, uh, which in in, um, in the Kuban, which is just, I mean, that's the symbolism is just loaded with female power. Wow. And, uh, you know, those people also become Hellenized in that late period by the fourth mm -hmm. century BCE. Uh, so the Sarmatian women's graves have also Amazons and Maenads and different you know, things going on in them. Mm. But, you know, headdresses with goddesses and these tall headdresses that are very much congruent with what we see in Central Asia. So, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, things and I won't I won't describe the whole book, but that kind of gives you a, a gist. It's like there's there's more interrogation of what female power looked like and how it was being talked about. Yeah. Wow, in Max. Technology. Honestly, like I, I, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you oh, do it. Witches, but... not to leave out witches. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's uh, and I, I, I absolutely understand when you talk about it being sort of a source because that's that's how it feels. It feels like it's something that you could check back into. Uh, yeah. Every time you want to talk about, you know, I have a student that is interested in Iphigenia. And I I said to her just a couple of days ago, oh, Max wrote this book and in it, there's a section on Iphigenia. And so people can pick out, they can begin by picking out what they're interested in and then, yeah, exactly. right, expand into. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's like, it's, it, I, don't, I think, and I don't, I don't necessarily read books from front to back. You right. know, you, you can kind of like start where you're interested and it kind of pulls you in. And one of the things that was really important to me is I, I had to render 270 illustrations so that you know i mean searching copyrights and printing fo fo um, half tones and all of that stuff would be impossibly expensive and probably take 10 years longer to do so i simply drew the visual evidence because that's which an I important love. part of the culture yes yeah to okay. see that which has been withheld it's there it's in the art but we don't get shown these yep. very powerful images yeah. so that and, and and also the the very searing and and distressing ones you know yeah. Um, you know, like the rape of Cassandra at Troy when the Greeks conquered Troy yeah. and the way that they depicted it, they were getting off on it. It was a pornographic. I mean, Cassandra did not sit naked at the at the Palladion of Athena in, uh, you know, she's wrapping her arms around the goddess because she knows what's coming next. And Ajax yeah. comes in and tears her away and, and rapes her. Yeah. So, you know, the, there's a whole pornography of the rape of Cassandra yeah. where she's already naked as she's at the base of the statue. And sometimes she's even shown with her legs spread. You know, it's like, there's, this This is the market. The Greek yeah. male market is demanding this art and, and snapping it up. And so we have many examples of it that have survived. Um, you know, it's, uh, I just think that, you know, one of the, it's really important to look at bias and interpretation in the way that we yeah. approach this material. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, the source book, just to be able to uh, look at that and have something which I hope will, you know, be a way to authenticate the information we do have. And and so here's yeah. something else. I have still haven't done that with, with witches and pagans, but I actually paid somebody to index this. The book would have been even longer and more expensive had I put an index in it. And it would have also been delayed. So it, it's taken almost another year to get right. an index but the index will be online. So that will be a resource for, you know, once, you, oh, where was that section? Where in that book? I remember I read that. It's going to be online and you can do a digital search for your term. So you don't even have to 
go through the alphabet. I love you. that. I love that. At the Suppressed uh, Histories Archives. No, like... no, no. Because no? the Suppressed Histories Archives became nonprofits several years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's Valetta.net is ah. Valetta Press is okay. where there's only place the book is available from. Actually, mm -hmm. you have to get it from, from my press. And so on the page for the book, if you scroll down, there's a section on commentaries, there's a glossary, and the index will be going up within a month, I hope. Um, oh. So that will be there. And another thing about putting the index online digitally that I think is really good is it will be more visually accessible. So if you can't read small print, because I would have had to put it in seven point type <laughs> to squeeze it into the book, you know, right. you can blow it up to whatever size you want. But the digital searchability is really a plus. Yeah, that's Pretty wonderful. Good. Wow. And, and that, I mean, that, that in itself will be a library of knowledge uh, and source. Yeah, and, and the bibliography as well as online and the end notes. So, you know, because that's part of the thing, women who are really interested in this, then you begin to figure out where are the sources, you know, where are the original sources? Because so much of what we start up looking at is the secondary sources and they're biased. They, they literally winnow out the things we want to know. Yeah. And, and so, you know, some of the sources I found really valuable, for example, is Pausanias, who yeah. is in Hellenic era, you know, even a Roman era, yeah. a guy that traveled around and he wrote down all the local stories, not the, not the Panhellenic superstructure, but the local stories about the goddesses and their sanctuaries and the, and the stories about them uh, in all these places. Yeah. And, and this is the other thing about, it's not just Greece. When I started out, I'm just thinking Greece. But it's really Hellenic, Hellenic world, because we're also talking right. about Asia Minor, uh, Thrace, Sicily, which is Bulgaria, uh, Macedonia. We're talking about Italy and Sicily. And this all spreads because Artemis Ephesia, for example, yeah. gets spread all the way to Marseille. You know, so the original goddess, the original foundation of Massilia is by a priestess who has a vision and she's supposed to bring the icon of Artemis to Massilia, they right. found this city. And there's also, uh, I think also Artemis veneration at, uh, it's called Emporias now in, in uh, Valencian Spanish, but it was originally Emporion. It was a market, a Greek trading post on the coast of Spain, you know? And so Hellenic culture spread and it spread into, I mean, you see influences on Persian goddess art, Iraqi goddess art, and as far away over as Gandhara, in what's now Pakistan and Afghanistan. Wow. You know, so it really had a wide purchase. And, um, you know, those places often really also apply their own interpretations, their own takes. But, you know, it's, it's just been very influential. And so much as I resisted it, I just really had to do this analysis because, you know, it is the foundation of Western Civ and we're still dealing with all of these tropes, mm -hmm. you know, even just like in the movies, the hero movies, that, that the glorification of the violent hero right. with, you know, many women around, you know, James Bond or whatever, you know, yeah. that is still very, very much an active theme yeah. in late capitalist patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even the Marvel movies and everything, everything, yeah. Um, yeah, it, everything is about sort of the male hero, give or take here and there every now and then there's a female hero that is often very much just a replacement of the male mm -hmm. hero in the same story, some kind of battle, some kind of war, someone right. has to be the, you know, it's the same. Yeah, it's the most cliche. And yet we continue to absorb these stories um, and they're quite, yeah, quite damaging to well, and, and here, you know, in this way, it's also similar to the ancient Greeks, because at that time, the dominant cultural production was from the male poets, mm -hmm. male writers, artists, sculptures, you know, all of this. It was all being told by men and their interests and their interpretations dominated. And this is still true now. I mean, we have a few female filmmakers that are very much on the back foot. But, you know, these very powerful new technological uh, platforms whether it's gaming or movies, uh, graphic novels, you know, yeah. it's still highly male dominated. Yeah. That you know, the new cultural narratives are still, yeah. they're, they're not being produced by women. Women don't have that yeah. reach. 
much. They don't have the economic wherewithal or support. Yeah. You know, the producers are looking for what will sell, and that's not what they're looking at. They're looking at, they, they want to continue the hero narrative or even the anti-hero. You know? True, true. It, it reminds me of this thing I saw on TikTok once where this guy was, I don't know, was a, a making a post about Titanic and at the end of Titanic, the older lady drops the heart and the whatever. And someone said, oh, look, this is how women behave after the guy died for her, Some, something like that. Anyways, one of the things that I thought was really interesting as, as I was watching this, I was like, but you know that that woman, whether whatever you think of her was actually written by a man. So right. exactly what you're saying, Max, in a sense, is like you are criticizing the stereotype that is written by a man for men of men's impressions of how women behave or grieve or whatever. Like, I don't and know. It's that, all still just to degrade the women. Right. And I don't know that anybody pulls back that far to be like, oh, well, look at these, this female character. And then I'm like, well, who wrote that character? Let's let's do that first. You know? Yeah. Totally. Because, yeah. you know, this is why yeah. feminist cultural criticism is so important, you know, and this is this was a major focus in women's studies at least for its first 30 years, is the way that male storytelling or even male uh, supposedly scientific uh, study right. shapes things. That's right. You know? And it's like, you know, they didn't get around to even really doing the biology of the clitoris until like the very end of the 20th century. That's right. You know? yeah. And and it's just there's all these ways. And I think most women accept the framework without realizing yeah. that they are accepting something that is very much structured to a purpose. Yeah. To a domination. Yeah. You know, because that's just what is out there. And so it's whether you did like this movie or didn't like this movie, but it's not really about analysis, again, pattern recognition. Yeah. Of what yeah. they're pitching at us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're starting a bit, like every now and then I will see, I mean, I'm, I'm on social media every now and then I'll see something like the difference between a male director and a female director. And, and people are starting to sort of present these situations and show the difference between the way women write women and the way that men write women, let's say, but overall, you know, it's still, I mean, we're just, we're just beginning this. Yes. Like, because like, even like the first woman to get best director was for the Hurt Locker. So it's a military mm -hmm. movie. And mm -hmm. I just happened to see something yesterday that was taught. It was showing movies and how much men talk in the movie and how much women talk in the movie mm. and the hurt locker. There are no female voices at all. Wow. You know, it's just like in order for her to succeed at the, in that uh -huh. context, she had to make a completely male oriented movie. That's right. You know, and I actually haven't seen it, so I don't know what my opinion. Of I've it heard is, of it, but, but I haven't seen it either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, the economic model of what succeeds and yeah. the calculus of what gets chosen. And there are all these labels. This is another part of it. The layers of gatekeeping yes. of what movie gets funded and who the screenwriter is and the way that they pitch the story, which constant, I mean, I'm very picky about what movies I go to see because it makes me angry. Right. You know, to see the, they, the way they do women. Yeah. And you know, this is, this is all part of a structure of power. And uh, until women see this, we have a problem. I remember we had a lot of struggles in feminism in the 70s over cultural feminism versus socialist feminism. And, you know, really our whole movement was a left-oriented movement. You know, right. we were anti-racist, we were internationalist, we were anti-military, um, you know, anti-war, uh, ecological, many things. But it was uh, the, the, some women really felt like cultural feminism was this escapist thing that was not important. And yet over time we see how important cultural representation is, Yeah, you know, how it's an essential part of even the choices that women make. If women are exposed to this completely dominational uh, framework, their values are shaped by that. Their sense of the possible for them is, is also foreclosed by that. Yeah. And the choices they make are therefore influenced by that. So if you don't change the culture, you're ultimately not going to have a successful political movement or economic change or all the other things that we need. You know, same with anti-racism. You have to have a cultural realization that spreads about the lies and the distortions and the omissions that shape the way i mean you know the, the the whole crystal fascist movement that's yeah. been gathering with trumpism 
you know, women are buying into that because they're simply not conscious. You know, they're buying into these very same dominance narratives, in this case, uh, an authoritarian Christian model, you know, hmm. patriarchal Christianity, male headship. Yes, yeah. God wants you to obey, you know. Right. <laughs> Right. I, I, yeah. I mean, you are, you're more patient I, I, than I am. I think sometimes I can't, I can't even, it's very hard. It's very hard for us to, but it reminds me of that sort of master servant mentality. And I have to remind myself that perhaps some women are just, yeah, they're just not conscious of these things. Um, and so, you know, kindness and sharing and things like that, we, that's the tools we need to use. But sometimes it's very frustrating because then these yeah. women are used, of course, as examples of, you know, this is the proper one. But woman. not all women You're agree not. that women should be free. That's right, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, but I, I think that, that the work that you're doing and you have been doing, I mean, forever. It's not just now. I just think that now with social media and all of these things going on and perhaps our new awareness of the goddess, uh, I feel like everyone that I've talked to knows your name and knows your work. And it's just so exciting because it's like, oh my gosh, we are, we're, you know, it's getting out there. It's spreading out there, you know. Um, getting critical mass. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, social media has... I mean, you know, we have all this shadow banning going on right now, but it is it is a tool. And to that end, I've been blogging on the Express Histories Archives page on Facebook. That is really where most of my research is, not so much on my website, mm. suppresshistories.net, which that's going to change. I need to integrate all that material into, into the website. But that's a good resource. I do goddess studies there. I do indigenous studies, a lot of different subjects. But uh, that's a place you can go. And especially if you go through the photos section, there's like tens of thousands of images, basically photo essays in there. Yeah. And so that's a place. to go. And the other thing I'll mention is I have open access videos on YouTube under the Max Dashu channel. Okay. So I have um, there's a lot of really beautiful Sudanese goddesses. I have a, a whole presentation on ancient Kush is up there, open access and you'll see there's a bunch of other uh, goddess content on there. Um, and then I have uh, the Teachable platform, which is Stream On. And, and there's a lot of other videos yeah. there that people can access. I've taken a couple of those. You know, you really pioneered that. I mean, you were you were doing those pre-COVID, pre you know. Um, mm -hmm. And what what a genius way to share that, to share those uh, online. And now, I mean, now... People are like, oh, yeah, of course, something's online or a webcast or whatever. Right. Um, but I've taken a couple of your, yeah, of your webcasts. And yeah, again, it's just fascinating. But I also love the visual aspect of it, right? This is this is really my approach is teaching with images is absolutely, yeah. it's so much more powerful than just talking about it. Agreed. You have to see it in order to be convinced on a gut level that mm -hmm. we have had other realities as women. When you see yeah. the medicine women. You know, and, and these these archaic goddess images that are not like the, you know, Venus un unsuccessfully trying to keep her clothes from falling off type of representations, right? Right. Really solid, potent, powerful gaze. You know, goddesses looking right out at you, you know, and whether they're they're cupping their breasts as the life giver or they're just standing there as this really uh, powerful embodiment, you know, of, of humanity, there's there's it 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 affects you on a gut level and i started doing slideshows in 1973 wow and you know i just saw the impact that had i mean it did for me also because me i was thinking about i know there are other historical realities for women and i have to find evidence of it you know so this was a way of documenting and showing you know when you see a, a phone tea priestess in dahomey doing this very dynamic dance you know, this is something entirely out of the realm of, you know, nuns filing into the church, you know, in order to sing matins or whatever. It's it's uh, it's potent and it's uh, it's ecstatic. Yeah. So, um, you know, we need to see that in order to expand our own worlds for what's possible for yeah. us as well. Well, Mac, I agree a hundred percent. That so that that was actually one of my inspirations for 
going into museums and photographing a lot of the figurines and the different figures of women, things that we can't find on Google or, or don't make it into a book. Well, one, because you can't publish so many images. Um, and I wanted to share that with people who maybe will not make it to some random museum in some random place. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, but this year, actually, I'm also starting to do like a live taking people live with me at the sites, at certain sites, because, you know, like, oh, good idea. Like all all places, you know, if the site you pay, if you pay for the site, sometimes, you know, the Greeks or the Romans are like, oh, no, you got it. You can't do this. And you can't take people on Zoom, whatever. But anyways, I, yeah. I really like this idea, again, of of showing people the actual space who maybe cannot make it out there. And yes. I think it's I the same, it. right. It's the same idea that like if we see it, um there is less possibility for someone to go, oh, and one of the things I'm starting to do this this summer is uh, map all the Artemis temples, like on a Google Maps mm -hmm. uh, with my own photos and things. Because one cool. of the things for me with Artemis is people are always like, oh, yeah, you know, she wasn't that important or she wasn't that big, blah, 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 huh. yeah. you know, and uh, and so especially the archaic, she was so amazing. Right. And I'm just like, yeah. if you could see it on a map and I could show you mm -hmm. pictures and and also it's fun, you know, to do all this. Uh, but I think you're right. Like the visual aspect of it is 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 evidence. I mean, it's more convincing, you know. And then there's a lot of, especially women, but there's a lot of people who can't afford to travel or don't know where to right, go. Like me, <laughs> you know. I haven't been to these places, right? Like, yeah. and 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 but in the in the image, like sometimes I see on Facebook because I follow your suppressed um your suppressed history archives, uh, and sometimes there's images there where I'm like, holy like there's so many images this exists <laughs> you know I, i'm just like wow you know and then you're scrolling yeah. through and you're like oh my god because we don't even know that there are so many images right uh, you know you have to go dig in for them so and, and here's the thing if you yeah. see it you feel it i mean yeah. psychologically emotionally you know yeah it enters you in yeah. some way yeah you get to see different ways of being women yeah you know, and, and women's power. There's just, a, it, it's different. You know, it's the same way that music is different. You know, you have poetry, but when you put it to music, it adds this whole other dimension. You know, it yeah. just really deepens the experience. I love that. I love that. Wow. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't even know what to say, Max. It's, it's just, it's exciting and it's wonderful. And it's, um, I can't wait to read your next one. I kind of, I kind of digested this whole thing. I also thought I'm going to take my time with it. And then I fell down the, the rabbit hole because the way you write it too is really, really readable. Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah I'm, really, I'm really trying to bridge the gap between the scholarly language and just making it ordinary accessible as much as possible. Uh, I mean, you've done it. And, and, and like, so, you know, I, I love the fact that there's references because of course, you know, right. That's your thing. Yeah. But uh, but also that it's readable in the sense that I was even thinking in the way that you're not really quoting too much or like even doing the block quotes. I was like, this feels like a story. I can see your references, but it was so good to read. Um, so yeah, I think, and what I mean by that is I think that everyone can ex access it and then it could be used as a teaching tool, um, you know, for women who gather and want a source of that. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, I think you did a fantastic job. Um, thank you. So thank you. I mean, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I mean, we need these resources and, and, and there, there are many women working in many, many areas. I mean, it's like the Native women authors are turning out knowledge that we just could not access before, you know, so this this yeah. is something that's happening. And yeah. well, one other thing about the, the, the webcasts I do, they arose, actually, I was doing them before COVID. I was using yeah. GoToWebinar in the beginning, like 2008, I think I started teaching Amazing. online courses. Uh -huh. And because I teach with images, I wanted to be able to screen share. I mean, being able to teleconference in that way, screen sharing was just such a breakthrough because I could finally do a slide talk basically with people all over the world, you know, time zones permitting, of course, you know, yeah. but I, I started using those to teach my classes. And then that in turn was pushing me okay, now we have to do the pre-dynastic Egypt. Now we have to do one on ancient Iran. Now we have to do one on Celtic women, whatever it was. And right. so, you know, I'm kind of churning out these PowerPoints and then sharing 
sharing them in, in, in these in this way. And so I'm still doing that. I teach an online course every year that it's just whatever my research is about, whatever comes over the transom and also things I'm actively working on. And this year, the course is called Rematria. And it's really looking, I'm, I'm finally going back to the archives and digging through all my file cabinets and pulling out, okay, let's do Southeast Africa and the oracular women's traditions there. Very parallel to Delphi in certain ways. They had a sacred pool with a python, a rain python. Oh, wow. And there are, are all these prophetic women in, in Malawi and Zimbabwe and different places. And also matrilineal societies in, in, in that corner of Africa. And so, you know, I'm trying to track the matricultures in right. different places and, and, you know, then just kind of work up what I have because it sits there in these file folders. And I need to kind of like integrate everything I have in the same way that happened with this book. Wow. And, and uh, you know, just kind of like put it together because otherwise if, if I don't actively, if, if I just only deal with what I'm always tracking all the time, it's like, this is this new archeological find and this, you know, new book was published or whatever. Right. You know, and just kind of like really dig through what I've been collecting since 1969 and just go into it and, and try to, you know, put it together and share it with the yeah. students and, and then do these webcasts. So that's, that's kind of what I'll, I think I'll be doing from, from now on is just. To I, keep... I love that. And where, okay. So, and people can come to, where can they sign up for things like yeah, that? Okay. So it's on the teachable platform. They can look, they can just do a search for suppress histories portal. And uh, I, I use teachable as the delivery method for the photo essays, but then okay. the only live component. So you can do it all and you're totally on your own schedule. The only live component is the monthly webcasts, and I do two because of time zones. Mm. And then if no, neither of those times work, people can access the recording for a set period of time. And so um, I'm going to be doing one uh, for Women's History Month on women, women speak out, women write on, about women's speech and writing, which grew out of a video that I have on my YouTube channel that's called Silencing Women's Speech. Mm. And the history of that. And of course, this is what happens with my slideshows. They become too big for their britches and they have to break, break up and fission off into, you know, more specific things. So, so I thought though it would be really good to do something, you know, on the politics of women's own speech, our own analysis, our expression of our, whether it's philosophy or political realities, you know, um, and, and writing, because those have both been very constrained areas. Yeah. Even more so with writing, because most women never get to even have access to literacy. Not that that is necessarily the best thing in the world, but you know, uh, oratory is very important. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. but speech also, you know, the ways that women speaking in public has been attacked in a really systematic way in patriarchal societies, and the women who are allowed to speak, and that there again, it's like that gatekeeping function really yeah. kicks in. Who are the women who make it through the gatekeepers, the editors, the film producers? You know, what actually surfaces to our view is very carefully curated. Right. You know, and I'm not saying that as a conspiracy so much as that the curation is male preference. Yeah. You know, and the things they think are important and not important, but yeah. also things that threaten them and they don't want to see out there, yeah. you know. And, and so that governs both our speech and our writing. And we're going through in this period of backlash that's been going on for decades now, uh, increased attacks on women's right to speak, you know, yeah, uh, or lead. So that's, uh, you know, yeah. for Women's History Month, which we're right now in, uh, to me, every month is Women's History Month, but I agree. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's a theme I want to explore more. The dance has been coming up more and more, um, more and more. And and I, I really, truly believe that the dance, I mean, people do, a lot of goddess groups do a lot of singing and a lot of tours do a lot. Of, there's lots of singing. And now I feel like the dance has been coming up more and more. And that, yeah, like, so people are like, what kind of dance? Like I taught this one course and, and the students were like, what kind of dancing was the labyrinth dance? And I thought... I'm, I actually don't really know. And so then I went Googling, you know, women's dances and ancient Greek or ancient, whatever, Cretan. Not that there's much, you know, obviously everything's modernized, but 
Um, but people are interested in the physical. And then there's this whole movement of embodying the goddess, embodying that. Yeah. So, so I think the dance plays, but it seems to be spreading. So I can, I can see, I don't know, women starting to dance and create more and more dances and create more, you know, and that would be just just amazing. Yeah, this this is something that was my path in the 70s was really, you know, uh, it's so transformational that when you're dealing with your own personal or cultural wounds, reclaiming your body is ground zero. Mm, you know, yeah. there's there's all these ways that trauma and, 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 and humiliation or all the things women go through embeds itself in the body, the way yeah. you hold your body. And so movement and incantation to me are, are really just essential. And it's also the, the what you see over and over again in, in an international scan of women's ceremony. You know, th these are ways that this is how we overcome things. You know, you have to access the fount of wisdom, and it's it's not a it's not an intellectual process. It's something that's really deeply transmutational in your blood and bone through yeah. movement and the way that we reharmonize, the way that we throw off and release you know, painful experiences and memories, you know, how we deal with all of that uh, chant too. It's like the activation of your vagus nerve right. resounding in your chest. So there's this way that in which breath and sound are merged. And you, I mean, you've been in ceremonies, you notice you come out and you feel different. Yeah. You, because you've been chanting and dancing. Yeah. Well, one other thing about the women's dance that you're researching, because back to the Geranos, that's the closest identification we have about what they were, what the dance in the labyrinth would look like. Right. Is that the name for that in Greek means the crane dance. I saw that in your book. That's fascinating. Cranes. Yeah. And, and, but you know, yeah. they, they do seem to describe it as a, somewhat of a spiral dance, but not necessarily always in a line because the, the descriptions, the ancient descriptions talk about like, you know how you have the, the frescoes at Thera and there are these spectators watching the ceremony. Yeah. Um, they're, they're actually sitting in almost like bleachers. That's right. Watching the dancers on the, on the main ground, on the main dancing ground. And they're coming in rows and they're interpenetrating. Those rows are crossing each other and advancing and retreating. And so there, you know, there's a lot of interesting things to, to look into about that, mm. that we can expand upon. Because it is something that also is the way that the individual merges and joins intention with community. It's like we were very much in relation to each other. And this is what, you know, the spiral dances that I've been to, you know, you're gazing into the eyes of, of the women as you pass them, yes. you know, and, and acknowledging each one. And there's, there's various choreographies that, that that could be enacted through. Right. Yeah. But I, I really want to see us rebuild or, or recreate a form of collective ecstatic chant and dance huh. you know that would really be something that just transforms our consciousness individually but also as a group that that takes you beyond the places we're stuck you know there's something we really need that because there's so much pain and you know we we just get entrapped in energetic patterns and, you know, here we are bombarded by all the electromagnetic magnetic fields and, you know, yeah. so many different things. We're so far from the natural in yeah. the way that we're, we're having to live that we have yeah. to find ways to renew that connection. I love that. I've only, nectar. I, I, I love that. I've only been part of one ecstatic dance uh, and it was it was like life altering. Uh, yeah. And they had us wear um, like these things on our eyes. It was actually quite a long, it was quite a fantastic process, but in short, you couldn't see other people, although you had people protecting you and all this kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, and so they guide you through a meditation and you're dancing with the music and it, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think I can't even imagine the healing that would take place if we had these on a regular basis and available to, to women and Yeah. What a what a what a great goal, Max. Yeah, I haven't been to another one because actually I don't I haven't really they're they're not that available to be honest. Uh, right, and you know well, there's all these weird economics because it's like women don't have access to spaces. 
right. women's spaces that we shape and, and, you know, safeguard so that, you know, you have to rent a hall. Like there's yes. a group here, um, Daughters of the Goddess that rent, you know, they rent the veterans hall or whatever in order to have these, these spiral dances that, or other ceremonies that they do. So yeah. we have to buy access. So then you have That's to right. charge money. That's and, right. you know, there's all these things or like even just then there's the women's lands. And so this happens on on the women's lands. And it's a place that you really feel safe because yeah. you don't have to worry about some rando coming by and harassing everyone, yeah. you know, or just making them uncomfortable. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, the presence of. Uh... And anyway, yeah. um, just to be able to dance in nature. Yeah. You know, and this is what was so great at all the women's festivals is that you had that happening you know, in the woods somewhere. And, yeah. you know, that's just, there's something about being in nature, very different than the veterans hall, you know, that really <laughs> enhances your ability to get there. This is what yeah. we all want to do. We want to get back to our core reality. You know, the, the, the Taoists have this great phrase, the original face, your original face before birth. Oh, you know, wow. Who are you really? Who are you before you were all conditioned? by culture and personal history you know that, that entrapped you into the patterns that we are all dealing with whatever our health issues are whatever you know habits that we're caught in internet addiction or whatever it may be yeah. you know yeah to, to be amongst you know to be tree bathing forest bathing yeah you know and you're in those kinds of spaces and to chant and dance there yeah is it's potentized I but it's very hard for women to get to nature, you know, to have that kind of, of safety because, you know, what's out there. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I was at a retreat, you know, I was lecturing about Persephone, whatever, and they let me participate in this event, this day, full day event. So it was a bit of a blessing, but you're right. Like you have to pay to get there and then they had to rent this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, I love that, that perhaps we can make that a goal that when women gather dancing, should be a part of the circle always, you know, I know singing is always a part of the circle and some dancing, but, but perhaps that's something that we can add to the, cu to the curriculum. <laughs> well, yeah. And especially okay. with singing, what, what, what tends to happen is kind of like in the Western civil line of things is singing songs, Yeah, you know, kind of like ballad songs with choruses and stuff. And that can be very powerful. I'm not putting that down, but the ecstatic, yeah, There's a certain kind of music that takes you to the ecstatic. Yeah, the, the spiritual union of the ecstatic. Yeah. And it, there's much more about a polyphonic thing, not necessarily harmony that you have to learn to do musically, but you know, the toning and sounding and overlays of sound that augment. And women, I've I've been in many ceremonies where they do this. They might do a hum at the end that turns into a polyphonic layering of sound. Right. That, you know, really just lifts the energy right up. Um, we have to relearn those those styles. And you can taste that. South African music has that. You know, if you've mm -hmm. ever heard Mary Makeba, you know, no. there, there's a way really powerful me melodies that can also be really just enhanced with rhythmic patterns to them. I mean, that's where, you know, I'm very into ethnomusicology because of that exploration. And there's a very interesting uh spiritual music that's coming out of south america hmm. i don't i don't even know if there's a name for it but i'm listening to it a lot on youtube really gorgeous songs that hmm. are in spanish but according to kind of like native south american musical sounds with charango right. and different things and they're singing about you know why don't we chant to the waters my people don't chant to the waters anymore and oh. you know it, it's like the very moving lyrics so there's this whole explosion it's it, it it has to do with goddess religion. It might not specifically be packaged as goddess religion, but they're singing to Pachamama, you know. Wow. And it's uh, there. There are things that are arising all over the place, you know, and certainly in in, in the native communities, you know, they with the powwows and and, and the the music and and ceremonies that that are being reclaimed and decolonized. I think that you know, there's just many cultural strands that are are trying to regrow back into a natural way of being human i love that i love that well we are we are at the end max <laughs> I, i've had some people they're like i could listen to this forever but I, I don't know if that's really the case but um 
first, I want to say thank you for coming and for such a fantastic discussion. And then I'd also like to right away invite you for future discussions, maybe uh, when the next book comes out or you have something sure. else going on. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Just, Absolutely. Yeah. I, would, I would love to. Yeah, this has been wonderful. So don't go away. I'm just going to thank you all yeah. for listening to us. Uh, I'm just going to stop recording and uh, go and look below this video for all the links uh, to Max's work and her website and all of the places. Thank you all.